The average age of the Lakers is 32.4, making them not only the oldest team in the league today, but one of the oldest in history. However, what's glided away from most people's perspective on this Lakers team is the mix of young players they've acquired along with veterans. In this video, you'll meet the new LA Lakers and find out if their age will ultimately cost them. Before continuing, over three quarters of the people who watch this channel are not subscribed, so if you fall into that percentage, please subscribe. Also, leave a like on this video, it takes a few seconds and makes a massive difference. Everyone's saying the Lakers are too old, and LeBron's telling people like this to keep that same energy once the season starts. Right now, Staples Center is being called the old folks home. So, Sam, are the Lakers just too old? I think they are, I really do, and, and it's not just because of age, because I think that with age comes experience, and I respect age. Max, as you know, I talked about LeBron and his experience, but I'm more concerned about the injuries. Like, that's where my issues come. Your young, one of your youngest superstars, AD, he's 28 years old, but he's been injury prone. He was out for 30 games last year. LeBron James, who's, who's 36 years old, who's went to championship after championship after championship, he missed 26 last year. And then two years before, he missed 17 games in a row before he had to sit out the rest of the season. Carmelo Anthony, who we're glad that the Lakers fans are ecstatic right now. You got your shooter. He's 37. And so I'm not necessarily concerned about the age when it comes to experience. I'm more concerned about health. I'm high on the Lakers, but can they stay healthy? And yes, the Lakers are damn old, but the argument that they're too old to be contenders can be countered by a few points. A, the Lakers had the shortest offseason in American major sports history. By a full 28 days, this year's offseason beat out the NHL's back in 2012-13, for the shortest period of time between a final series and the start of the next season ever. And the argument that they had four months off before the bubble is thinly veiled. Anyone who knows professional sports is aware of how long it takes for an athlete's body to recover. A typical NBA offseason is around 20 weeks from the end of the finals to the resumption of meaningful games. That consistency of rhythm has allowed players to get into a pattern of preparing themselves mentally and physically. Teams who were eliminated earlier in the playoffs had around 75 to 80% of their typical offseason, while the Lakers and Heat got just half of their typical rest time. For players that have been in the league for five to seven plus years, getting merely 10 weeks to recover for the next season is going to throw you off. And those 72 days didn't include when the Heat and Lakers had to return for training camp. When the 2021-22 season kicks off, the Lakers will have had 138 days off, which chalks up to 19 weeks and five days, double the amount of time they had for 2020-21. The second point I could use to counter that the Lakers are too old to be contenders is acquisitions they've made this offseason that have gone overlooked by the media, likely because it doesn't serve their narrative. Without much cap space after the rust trade, LA used a flurry of minimum contracts and taxpayer mid-level exceptions to fill out the rest of their roster. This meant bringing in some much desired young pieces. Firstly, getting Malik Monk for the minimum was one of the biggest steals of 2021 free agency. The former lottery picks coming off a breakthrough season with the Charlotte Hornets. Despite that, the Hornets declined his qualifying offer, allowing Malik to enter unrestricted free agency, and wisely, the Lakers took advantage. Monk provides instant offense off the bench. He's disappointed in three of his four seasons in Charlotte, which is a much lower stake stage than he'll be on now, but given he's coming off an efficient year at only 23 years of age, plus the Lakers desperately needed youth, I thought this was a great move for the Lakers front office. Monk hasn't lived up to lottery pick expectations thus far, but he's been under the spotlight before. Of course, the pros is another level of pressure, but being the go-to score for a massive program like Kentucky is no joke either. Under coach John Calipari in 2016-17, Monk averaged 20 points per game as a Wildcat. Although Malik's been a role player who's faced growing pains in his career, a change of scenery is always a positive for underwhelming top draft picks. We'll see how Monk reacts to catching and shooting jumpers off passes from King James. Two hours after that signing, another young player, Kendrick Nunn, 
agreed to a two-year, $10 million contract, passing up more money from other teams to rock the purple and gold. Nunn may have just turned 26, but after four years in college, he's only got two years of pro experience. He's had a strong first couple seasons with the Miami Heat, putting up an impressive shooting line of 48, 38, and 93 last year. Considering Kendrick's sophomore season saw him significantly improve his efficiency across the board in terms of his field goal, three-point, and free throw percentage, experience in the NBA has had its effect. Who knows how much more upside that Kendrick has? Don't be too quick to doubt his talents. The man went from going undrafted to averaging 10 points per game in the NBA Finals as a rookie. The 15 to 20 points he can put up on a nightly basis could win the Lakers some games this year. Kendrick became the first player with 100 points in his first five games since KD in 2007, the first undrafted player to win multiple Rookie of the Month awards. He was a Rookie of the Year finalist who averaged 15 points over his first two seasons. Moving on to the 20-year-old Talon Horton Tucker, who signed a three-year, $30 million contract as well. It was big time that the Lakers retained him, but in his first true full season at the NBA level, Horton Tucker averaged 9 points on 45.8% shooting in 20.1 minutes per game. He has a long way to go with his 3-point shooting and defense, but his ability to attack the basket with his 7'1 wingspan and 234-pound frame added a valuable threat to the Laker offense. His playmaking mightily improved by the game. He averaged 1.9 more assists per game after March 15th and even posted four double-digit assist nights. The former second-round pick is extremely adaptable, which bodes well for his development. Horton Tucker has a real chance to be the Lakers' starting two-guard when next season tips off. With his affordable contract, he also remains their most tradable asset. LeBron's tweeted out in the past that Tucker's flat-out special, James and Tucker, built up some solid chemistry last year as well. Mac McClung hasn't made the roster, but he was signed to a training camp contract, and the former Texas Red Raider is currently showing what he has in Summer League. He put up 11 points off the bench in his first game, but just seeing the steady progression of this man's game throughout the years has been mesmerizing. Mac's work ethic and determination to get better is off the charts. Despite being undersized at 6'2", McClung makes up for that by being a scrappy, quick, and hustle-driven defender. Don't forget another undrafted guard for the Lakers who became a key cog in the rotation, the bald mamba Alex Caruso. Like Caruso, McClung will spend his first few seasons up and down from the G League to the end of the bench, but if the Lakers keep him in their system, I have no doubt he'll be lighting up Staples Center in a few years. If I had one pro comparison for McClung, it's a bigger, more athletic J.J. Barea. J.J. was only 5'8", but his hustle, shooting, and basketball IQ made him a 14-year NBA veteran and a champion. I could see Mack carving out a similar type career. So you've seen the current young players and potentially a future young player in Mack McClung, but the most valuable Laker free agent pickups were Dwight Howard, Carmelo Anthony, Kent Bazemore, Trevor Ariza, and Wayne Ellington. If this was 2013, they'd instantly be considered the championship favorite, but despite the old folks home jokes and those players being on their last legs in the pros, they still have some value. The Lakers desperately missed Dwight Howard's rim protection last season, Carmelo Anthony's still got 8 to 15 points per game in him, and Bazemore's still got some decent speed and playmaking to bring to the table. Ariza and Ellington are old as well, but it doesn't take too much to catch and shoot wide open jumpers. I'm not saying that the Lakers are title favorites, but age isn't what's going to cost them. LeBron's going to have double the amount of time that he had last year in the cryo chamber. And as I mentioned, Kendrick Nunn, Malik Monk, and Talon Horton Tucker should all be rotation players. When you really look at it, LA may have the ideal blend of youth and veterans. After an unorthodox free agent frenzy for the organization, they may have done just enough to surround LeBron with the right team to end his career. 
Are the Lakers too old in your opinion? Let me know in the comments. Follow me on Twitter at DFlow Hoops. I'm trying to become a force on Twitter, so go follow me there. That's at DFlow Hoops. Anyways, y'all, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next video.